So for a quick demo in how this works, um, I have my little virtual scope panel. And this is from a Rigel scope. So I have an actual monkey jam hooked up in a test program called an overdrive sign test where I just have a numerically controlled oscillator, a sine wave um, lookup table uh, that is generating a sine wave to the output. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn it up a little bit um, so we can see it. And over the remote USB, it's a little slow. And so there's my sine wave. Now, the test code takes a sine wave and rams it into my soft overdrive function. So here's what I want you to do is I want you just to kind of, I'm going to slowly, I have a little gain knob that controls how big the sine wave is. And let's just take a look at what happens here. All right. Notice as I go higher and higher, I'm starting to get more rounded at the top. I'm gaining my signal. I'm going to keep going. Keep. Now look at, look at this interesting behavior. I can get this nice, soft, you know, kind of clipping function where it's never a hard clip. That, that is absolutely beautiful, isn't it? So it's not like a transistor amplifier. Even when I crank up the gain, and look at this, I am really, I have my gain on the soft overdrive all the way up. At no point do I ever, um, you know, absolutely click, clip. I got this nice, soft kind of... Uh, uh, you know, transition region here. And so this is simply just demonstrating uh, the soft overdrive. I
All right, welcome back. So we're going to talk real quick about the last piece uh, with the monkey jam in real-time signal processing is how do we do nonlinear pro processing. So um, the tubes in an amplifier, uh, a lot of people uh, are absolutely in love with vacuum tube amplifiers because uh, they feel they sound better. Um, old Marshall Fender Vox. Um, so if we wanted to kind of simulate those and simulate how they behave, like how would you do it? So um, tubes in an amp, amp can, are definitely not linear, especially from the mathematical point of view, you know, over their operating region. They're very nonlinear. Um, and they will clip or limit at sufficiently high gains. You put a big enough signal, it's going to clip. Now, trans transistors do the same thing, although they just do it in a different way. So... Um, how can we how can we model this? So let's just take a quick look uh, at overdrive. So I have a side wave kind of uh, one cycle put on the screen, and I kind of have some red lines here showing an upper and lower limit. Let's say these are like the supply rails to an amplifier. So from the uh, most kind of like mathematically grotesque way we can do it is simply clip the tops and. You know, doing that is simply saying, you know, you know, if input is greater than some threshold alpha, then, you know, input equals alpha. You know, that'll take care of the top side. The bottom side, you got to do the same, except that it's a less than, you know. So that's, that is the most, gro I'll, I'll use the word grotesque way of doing it. Um, some amplifiers have what's called an asymmetric hard clip, where the, the, it, it's asymmetrical, meaning, um, let me draw like a line so we can see this. Actually, let me draw a straight line so you can see it. Let me go a little slower. And you'll notice that the top side is uh, clipped at a different level than the bottom. And so if you do a Fourier analysis of clipping, you know, it adds harmonics and it adds odd order harmonics because it looks more like a square wave. And that kind of makes sense. Um, so one way to, to view this is that uh, for, to model nonlinearities like clipping, you know, a simple if statement will work, but you, you don't really get a whole lot of uh, control over that. Is think about on one axis, you have your signal input. So your sine wave would go back and forth on this axis. And then we have a direct map to a signal output. So a hard clipping looks like this. You know, we have some slope here for a gain. And this slope uh, could be whatever you want it to be, steep or narrow. And then at some point, you have... Um, you know, it's just a constant value. So the higher you go on your input, your output is the same value. So in terms of sound, this kind of represents like a discontinuity here. Uh, you know, that hard transition region, you know, to kind of clip. So one thing um, tubes do is tubes just make horrible devices for switching anything. The reason is, is they have like a very soft clip. Um, and if you dig up enough research, you'll find out there is there are physical physics reasons why, you know, that they, they can't hard, you know, do a hard clip. Transistors can't. They they can saturate a lot easier. Um, so a tube, you know, has this behavior that it's a very soft clip. Now, this depends 100% on the tube, how it's biased. There's about 100 variables that go into this, but uh, at, the, at the end of the day is if you can get something that looks kind of like this, you can get pretty close. So uh, I, when I give this presentation, I ask, are there any good input-output functions to use? And then I ask, what function is this? Because if you look at it now, the input-output x goes up to 10, negative 10. I'm not worried about that because we can scale it, and it kind of limits at, uh, you know, pi over 2. This is the arc tangent. All right. It ha look, at, look at this nice uh, feature here. We have a nice linear slope, meaning that for small signals, nothing happens. But as the larger the signal gets, the more it kind of clips. All right. Or not clips, but rounds off. 
Now, there's another function very similar. The hyperbolic tan tangent function does this as well. I like arctan. Arctan actually has physical significant you, significance. You can look up um, mo mathematical models for tubes in their transconductance functions, and you can find arctan all over the place. So it's it's very organic in the sense that that's how tubes actually work. Um, there may be some tube models with hyperbolic tangent, but I've seen more arctan. And at the end of the day, do we even care? No, we don't care because maybe we want to we want to come up with something new. So I just want to seed an idea. So um, the next question is. You know, how do we calculate arctan x in an embedded controller? Um, you know, and I, I get lots of answers. This. They say, yeah, uh, you power series, you know, in, in, or use, you know, some sort of, you know, other polynomial-based um, approximation. But my answer is that's kind of dumb. You don't. You don't, you don't calculate it. Uh, use a lookup table. Uh, so depending on the lookup table and how big you want it, will control how, you know, how much resolution you have. Because you think about it, this an input-output function is a lookup table. For every uh, input you have on your x, for your input, you have some mapping to the output. So in the Monkey Jam software, let me bring up some of the Monkey Jam software here, and I'll just show you. We're going to look at this in another video, so don't get too concerned. Um, we have, I have a function called soft overdrive and hard overdrive. What those do, they're just fancy lookup tables into a couple different arc tangent tables. And the only difference I do with my tables is I control um, this slope right here. And the way I can control this is by when I generate the table, I can sweep through different you know, values of x from negative 10 to 10. Like, for example, I think soft overdrive goes from negative 4 pi to 4 pi. Hard overdrive goes from negative 24 pi to 24 pi. We're, we just control this right here in this amplitude where this, uh, you know, uh, kind of where this asymptote um, exists at. Normal arc chain is pi over 2. You know, we can we can move this up and down wherever we need to. So for a quick demo in how this works, um, I have my little virtual scope panel, and this is from a Rigel scope. So I have an actual monkey jam hooked up in a test program called an overdrive sine test, where I just have a numerically controlled oscillator, a sine wave um, lookup table uh, that is generating a sine wave to the output. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn it up a little bit um, so we can see it. And over the remote USB, it's a little slow. And so there's my sine wave. Now, the test code takes a sine wave and rams it into my soft overdrive function. So here's what I want you to do is I want you just to kind of, I'm going to slowly, I have a little gain knob that controls how big the sine wave is. And let's just take a look at what happens here. All right. Notice as I go higher and higher, I'm starting to get more rounded at the top. I'm gaining my signal. I'm going to keep going. Keep. Now look at look at this interesting behavior. I can get this nice soft, you know, kind of clipping function where it's never a hard clip. That that is absolutely beautiful, isn't it? So it's not like a transistor amplifier. Even when I crank up the gain and look at this, I am really I have my gain on the soft overdrive all the way up. At no point do I ever, um, you know, I absolutely click clip. I got this nice soft kind of, uh, uh, you know, transition region here. And so this is simply just demonstrating uh, the soft overdrive. I quite literally, it's called Patch OD Demo Sign Test. This is going to be in revision two of the software that um, we've pushed out to GitHub. And I have a pot controlling what's called this overdrive level. Um, so I have one of the pots controlling overdrive. So that's kind of cool. And so that kind of gives you a little demo of how we can get tube-like effects, you know, digitally. And you can play with different tables to your heart's content. And I, I would say this, don't try to model any one thing. That's been done before. See if you can come up with something new that just sounds really neat and send it to me. I'd, I'd be really interested. You know, I, I get really frustrated with 
sometimes guitar technology because the whole industry is based around modeling things that existed 50 years ago. But I think we can do better. We can do new stuff. And maybe that's you. Maybe you're going to come up with something kind of cool. Um, so, uh, so there that is. Let me move this out of the way. And so that's a way we can model nonlinearities. Now, we could do diodes this way. We could come up with curves to represent diodes. We could simulate um, you know, certain effects and amplifiers like crossover distortion. You know, and we can do things like that by changing, you know, for example, the input-output curve, maybe adding dead zones. We could do anything we wanted to. And the nice part, it's a lookup table. It's, it's computationally efficient. You know, you don't need a ton of memory to do it. You know, and it, it's, it's easy to do. Now, the last thing I want to talk about isn't necessarily when you first look at it, a nonlinear element, but we're going to add uh, some nonlinearity to it. Now, there's something uh, called a comb filter, and you can model a comb filter almost looks like, in, not almost, it is an FIR filter, um, except with a few little tweaks. Notice we have, you know, our standard, you know, transfer function here, uh, you know, or I'm sorry, difference equation, output equals input, and we add in some time history, but we have one data point. A comb filter is special in that um, we have a coefficient, but we have some delay value, but the delay value may be quite large. We might look at 100 samples ago. All right, now let's look at what the, um, if we fix this K to a fixed value, what that does. Now, I'm on the Wikipedia uh, page for a comb filter, and uh, this is a great reference um, on comb filters. Let me zoom in a little bit. There's the picture. Um, and this is what it kind of looks like in the frequency domain. You've get, you get this uh, kind of um, response plot where you just get nulls at certain points, and they're showing this in uh, you know frequency and radians per second. And by controlling the amplitude of the feedback tap, we can get the, the size of the comb is different. And then by controlling the depth K, this K value right here, um, we kind of control the, the, the uh, distance between the combs, where the higher it goes, the tighter those combs get. Now, that once again by itself is not nonlinear. What if we want to add nonlinearity to it, we get interesting effects, is that what if k is continuously variable? I'll say that again. What if we make k continuously variable? And if we do that, we get something called a chorus effect. Let me erase that. Nice. You might have heard of chorus before. All right, a chorus effect is a comb filter where the value of K is constantly changing. Now, how do you change it? Well, you could use a sine wave, you could use a triangle wave, you could use a square wave. Um, and there's a couple parameters. We have something called depth, which is how far the K goes. We have the, the sweep rate, which is the frequency at which it moves back and forth. And last, we have kind of like an intensity, which is this value alpha. And that's a chorus effect. And a chorus, we started with a linear structure, but by modulating a parameter real time, we made it nonlinear. And the reason it's nonlinear, it's now non-reversible. Uh, there's no way to reverse this. It, the order of operations definitely matters. Um, now, in the Monkey Jam software, there is a patch called Comb the Desert Chorus where you can do this. You can go ahead and play with that. It's called Comb the Desert Chorus. Uh, and you might get the nice space balls reference in there. Now, I'm going to point out, with one small change, we can make what's called a flange effect. You know, a flange effect, a flanger is a comb filter. Except that instead of feeding forward for like an FR filter, we feed back from the output. So by changing the comb filter to feed back instead of feed forward, that's all that's how we modify flange do flange effect. Now flange you got to be very careful. Choosing this value a 
um, if it's too large um, or too, you know, or too negative, or I should say, if the magnitude is too great, whether it's positive or negative, you can get uh, oscillation. You can get it to go out of control because this is essentially an IR filter where we're changing this delay in real time, moving it back and forth. And so what's interesting, the difference between a comb filter with a feed back instead of feed forward, instead of nulls in the frequency response, we get peaks in the frequency response. Um, and that's how you make a flange. Now, in the Monkey Jam software, I have two patches. Let me open that up. You know, one called Comb the Desert Chorus and Comb the Desert Flange. Now, it turns out in their actual processing routine, they do is exactly the same, except I have one small parameter about the comb filter I change. And that parameter is determined if I have a peaking comb filter or a nulling comb filter. And the only thing I do is I have a, a piece of software that makes my comb filter. I just have a a very slow sine wave oscillator um, that moves very slowly, uh, sub one hertz, uh, to generate the effect. Um, and by by moving this comb filter in real time and creating this variable length delay, or this variable delay, it has this detuning effect. And that's what kind of gives chorus the sound. It's like you're moving in, you know, another instrument at a you know at a slow rate it's kind of changing frequency and that, that and that's what kind of makes chorus sound like a chorus so um so there you go that's a nonlinear effect now you can find at about a, a hundred different places on the web how chorus and flange work and they might explain it a little different and i would really um encourage you to look at it um look at these different effects but really chorus and flange are taking comb filters where here is the one variant of the comb filter. We mix in a delayed version of our input, and then we just change, we just sweep or modify this K value in time. And so the rate at which we move that um, in kind of the depth, how big K is, um, coupled with the intensity, that, that value of alpha, we change uh, kind of how it sounds. Now, here's a tip. K, as soon as you get above 50 milliseconds in delay, your ear starts to kind of get decoupled from, it now really starts to sound like two different instruments and it can kind of sound kind of goofy. Um, you know, also you don't want the sweep to do too fast. That sounds really goofy as well. But I tried to give you some decent values to start with um, in the Monkey Jam software. So um, that's it for this video. Um, hopefully by now you've got enough information. Maybe you've loaded the code and started playing. But it gives you a little bit of background. Uh, there's plenty of information on the web uh, about digital audio effects. And hopefully this gives you a good start. Um, talk to you later.